I want to start the morning with just a quick public service announcement. For those that do not know, since last July, the city of Waco has been in a drought. And in fact, uh, the city has responded accordingly. We have water restrictions and you're only allowed to water or sprinkle your yard on certain days of the week. How many of you are familiar with these restrictions and this drought that we're in? For those that live in Waco, okay. Okay, that's awesome. And then how many of you, this is news that the preacher gave the news for the city. How many of you, it's new, it's okay. It's okay, you're just the people with dead yards or no yard, all right? That's what I know. Because today's a big day. I live in an address that has an even number, which means I can only sprinkle my yard on Wednesdays and Sundays. So I have to preach, which is an amazing gift and responsibility to the Lord. And then after 7 p.m. tonight, I can water my lawn, but only tonight and Wednesday. There's all these restrictions. And, and in fact, it, it's, it's more uh, uh, thought through and thoughtful than you would expect. I got on the Waco website. There's a 21 page document of how Waco is responding to the drought that we're in. It's been amazing. They're gonna lower uh, water usage by 30% by this plan that they're moving forward. And it is impressive. And I just, I've been encouraged. I love Mayor Meek. Dylan Meek is amazing. I don't think he's a water expert, but he's got a great team helping our city through this drought. And I start with that because the city has responded well to drought. And, and, and I even would say, I think they were ready for drought. And as we continue in our series of soundtracks, we're looking to different psalms. And today, this morning, we are going to look at our response to spiritual drought. What do we do in the seasons of spiritual drought? And I think this is important for us because nobody really warns you of this when you become a Christian. You see, you, you accept the free gift of, of, of Christ's forgiveness and, and belief in his, his life, his death, and his resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. And, and we're on cloud nine. We're like, wow, this is where life is found. Jesus is everything. I wanna tell everyone about him. We start opening up our Bible and we're just, we're crushing through the Bible, even though we're not always sure what it's saying, but we're loving it. We're loving time with the Lord. We're praying. We're, we're, we're praying for our neighbors, our lost friends, our lost family. We're just on fire. And then over time, what ends up happening is we open up the Bible one day and it's just, just doesn't hit quite as well as it did the day before. And then we, you know, we, we, we start praying again and it just doesn't feel as exciting as it used to. And maybe you come to church on Sunday and they sing a song like raise a hallelujah and you're like, well, I don't really like this song. I'd prefer a different song. Or you come on July 4th weekend and you get the bald college pastor and you don't get maybe somebody else that you might've wanted to hear. You're like, you know what? I think uh, I just don't feel like being here. <laughs> I appreciate that. Somebody's giving me some thumbs up from the back. <laughs> you got it. It's me. It's me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And nobody warns you for the moments where you'll come to church on a Sunday and people are raising their hands around you and you're like, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like God's around I don't feel like he's close. And nobody prepares us for those days. Or few people prepare us well for those days, but this text today does. And that's why we need it. And I know that not all of us are in a season of maybe lament where you're going through a challenging circumstance or, or something like that, but, but I know somebody around you is. And I know that one day you will be and so today we're gonna to learn a right response to spiritual drought. And then I think you could even be like me, where I, I audibly said to our sermon team this week, hey, I think it will be challenging for me to teach a lament or a, on spiritual drought when I'm not in it. Like I don't have anything crazy going on that I'm, 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 I'm having honest conversations with God that are challenging, I'm expressing my frustration. I'm not really experiencing that in some crazy way right now. I think it could be hard for me to connect to this text. And then what happened is I started studying this text. 
And I realized for really the last year, my wife and I have been experiencing this challenge. And it's this, it's that our spiritual life today doesn't feel the way it did a year or two ago. And the primary reason is because of this amazing gift that we, we were given uh, 11 months ago in the form of twins. We got a two for one special. And so we go to time with the Lord and sometimes it's interrupted. And in fact, yesterday, as I'm preparing for this sermon, I set my alarm to wake up early on a Saturday, spend time with God. It's gonna be amazing. I got some caffeine ready to join me and and I'm gonna spend time with the Lord. And Ellie, my daughter, decided to set her alarm two hours before my alarm, which was one hour before they were supposed to wake up. And so it's hard. That quality time with the Lord doesn't always look the same, doesn't feel the same, and that's been hard. My wife and I are both in ministry, so it's like my, my, our jobs and our, our livelihoods depend on our spiritual health, and, 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 and I realize this is as much for me today as it is for anyone. And so if you've ever even experienced a little bit of apathy, a little bit of it doesn't feel the same, I think this text will encourage you. So if you brought your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 42. We're, again, continuing our series called Soundtracks, going through the book of Psalms. Psalms are a bunch of songs, and that's why we call this Soundtracks. This morning, we're gonna see longing, lamenting, and lifting is what we're meant to do and how we respond to spiritual drought. And before we read the text, I wanna give you some interesting context. I nerded out about this, and... uh, Uh, So just stick with me. It's important about who wrote this psalm. You see, this psalm was written by the sons of Korah, which were essentially worship leaders in the time of King David. Think worship leaders like people that are up on the stage leading us in song. This was one of the worship leaders back in the day who had written songs of worship. And specifically, these uh, sons of Korah come from the lineage of Levi. And Levi was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. He had a son named Kohath. I put this on the screen so you can can follow me here. So Levi had a son named Kohath and the Kohathites oversaw caring for the sanctuary. And eventually one of the Kohathites was named Korah. And Korah specifically is the person that led a rebellion against Moses and God destroyed. It's one of those crazy stories in the Old Testament that you read and you're like, what is happening? That, that's what happens. But God preserves the sons of Korah. And, and seven generations later, we, are, we get Samuel, the prophet Samuel. And then a few generations after that, David assigns some of the sons of Korah to be worship leaders. And they write songs. And so I've given you these generations. It's not exactly, you know, one generation between each of them. There's differences in time. But that is who wrote this song, some worship leaders. And so as we read it, let let me pray as we approach the text this morning. Father, we do just come to you humbly to your word. Would it be our authority? Would your spirit move in this time? Help us to learn a response when... We pant and thirst for you and and we're left longing. Would you prepare us for those seasons? Would you encourage us if we're in that season right now? And for any of my friends that are here that don't know you, don't know the hope that we have in you, Jesus, would they see their need for you, Jesus, this morning? We love you and we pray this in his name. Amen. Psalm 42, verse one. As a deer pants for flowing streams, So my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me, my enemies say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God. Remember, a worship leader who would lead the people into the procession of the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. You see, I, I love this first verse describing a deer 
panting for flowing streams. This passage is showing us there's gonna be seasons of the Christian life where you're following Jesus, you're longing for Jesus, you're looking for Jesus, you're thirsting for Jesus, and the stream is dried up. The well has dried up. This is spiritual drought. When God feels far, you feel alone, you feel apathetic toward obedience, you go to the water and it doesn't seem like it's there. My first point is a simple encouragement that longing for God is normal. There will be seasons where we long for God and we won't immediately be satisfied. We won't immediately be satisfied. We will wonder where the water will be. You see, this passage has a built-in image about deer, a deer going to water. In fact, I took a picture of a deer in the drought last July. Here's a picture when I lived on a farm in a back house before I moved. Here's a deer just finding water. And here's the thing about deer. I don't know much, but what I do know is they're not that dumb. They know how to find water. This deer isn't thirsty because it doesn't know where to find water. The deer is thirsty because it's going where it knows water should be and the water's not there. The water is not where it usually is. And for us, just think about uh, all the times, maybe, I don't know if you've ever experienced where you go, go get water from your fridge and then one day it starts to squirt a little bit weird. You're like, wait, there's something wrong with my refrigerator. It's not, it's not giving me water the way it used to. And then, and then one day it just stops. And if you're a handyman or you've ever experienced this, you know that probably the pipes froze. It's happened to me before. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but if yours doesn't work, it could be frozen. Call a handyman. And so here's the deal. Like, it's like going to a place where you know there should be water and all of a sudden one day it's not there. And the way it looks in our spiritual life is I've already described it. It's when we open the Bible and we have our cup of coffee, we're at our spot, it doesn't hit the spot. We're at worship, it doesn't feel the same. We're at life group, and you just, you're like, man, I just would rather be anywhere else. This isn't quite as fun as it used to be. It's not as exciting as it used to be. Or maybe you're listening to some podcasts, maybe more than roommates, or maybe becoming something, and you turn it on, and you're like, ah, that one just wasn't as good, Right? just didn't hit the way some other ones hit. That's what a season of spiritual drought can look like. So my first encouragement is, hey, that's normal. Keep going to the water. Keep pursuing the Lord. All droughts in the history of droughts and in the history of the world have come to an end. That's the good news. And the next valid thought is why would God allow this? Like theologically, how could he? Why does he do these things? And I think the first thing uh, of thirsting for God and longing for God, at least here in the Old Testament, is it just points to the need for Jesus. Like in the Old Testament, as they long for a Messiah and they're thirsting for God, there is a, 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 a way that that thirst will be quenched in the one who is the water of life, the bread of life. And it's pointing to Jesus. And then there's a second thing for those of us that know Jesus, who are longing for Jesus and thirst for Jesus, and we don't feel like Jesus is there. It's okay. There will be seasons like that. And it's so that we could pursue him and love him. And so that he can teach us to love him even when he doesn't give us the feeling. Even teaching us to, to, to pursue him and love him even when we don't feel like it so that we might love him for who he is and not what he gives us, not just his benefits. And Jesus tells us he does this to prune us so that we may bear more fruit. We can trust in those dry seasons. It's so one day we can bear more fruit. We can be ready. So there's good news that longing for God is normal. And as I uh, studied this passage and I saw other passages, uh, I know that as we seek God, we're promised that God will seek us. But what I realized about all those passages that, that describe this 
they all include some sort of perseverance or diligence or, or, or waiting. Uh, Proverbs says, those who diligently seek him will find him. Deuteronomy says, if you search for him with your whole heart and soul. Luke says, don't just ask and get, it's ask and then seek and then knock. And then Deut- or, uh, uh, Jeremiah says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. It's not just an ask, get. There's a perseverance. The longing is normal. But there are times in drought where, where it's on us, where it's our fault. And so the first question we can ask ourselves in a spiritual drought, just to assess if it's our, on us, is, is am I pursuing God in the ways I know I ought to? Am I spending time in God's word? Am I praying? Am I, am I a part of community? Am I meeting regularly in community? Am I gathering with other believers on, on, on Sundays? Am I learning from God's word? You can ask yourself, am I pursuing God in the ways that I know I ought to? And then we can ask ourselves, are we hiding sin? Are we hiding any sin? The, the question is, is there any 2% that we haven't brought to the light? You see, sin can cause spiritual drought. Hiding sin can cause spiritual drought. Not not doing the disciplines of the Lord can cause spiritual drought. But then for those that are like, hey, I'm I'm doing the disciplines and I, I don't think I'm hiding sin. What about me? And I just want you to know that sometimes there just is spiritual drought and it's no one's fault. It's no one's fault. I love the way the late Tim Keller talked about this. He said, as Americans, we gotta blame somebody every time something happens. Like we are professionals at finding out who's to blame, whose fault is it, and then we're gonna sue them. Like we love that. That's the way everything in life works. It's somebody's fault. We gotta blame it. And so the first thought is in spiritual drought, is it my fault? The next thought is, is it God's fault? And here's what Tim Keller said. He's like, hey, it's not anyone's fault. He's just sovereign over it. God is sovereign over it. There will be seasons of drought that God is sovereign over and they're normal and I wanna encourage you. And that might not sound encouraging, but one day when you're in it, it will be encouraging. And you can encourage somebody in your life group or in your life that's going through a spiritual drought. It's okay. It's okay. Keep being faithful. So first we see that the longing is normal, but if we stop here, it, it's, it's not super, uh, it's somewhat impractical. Let's keep reading to see what we can do in spiritual drought. Verse five. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. That's where uh, the worship leader, the psalmist is, uh, from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, of Mount, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All the breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? The psalmist is cast down, depressed, anxious. Their soul is in turmoil within them. Their life feels as if roaring waterfalls are falling over them. It is loud and waves keep crashing over them over and over and over again. Jonah mentions this in Jonah 2, which we learned about a few months ago in our series through Jonah. He mentions this this feeling of, of the waves crashing over him as he prayed from the belly of the fish. This is serious spiritual drought emotionally drained on empty. But my favorite line that I want us to focus on this morning is verse nine. 
I say to God, my rock. You see, there's honor. It's like, hey, you're God, you are my God, you're in control. And then the next phrase. Why have you forgotten me? Where are you? You're my rock, but where are you? This sounds like he's talking out of both sides of his mouth, and that's what I love. There's honor because it's God, and there's honesty because he is feeling in a way that he is frustrated. Where are you? And that's the second point this morning, that we are meant to lament, which is just to express, lament to God with honor and with honesty. I love all the honor throughout this psalm. The psalmist describes God as the living God, describes God's steadfast love, the God of my life, God my rock. There's so much honor and yet there is so much honesty. Hello God, where are you? Why are my enemies making fun of me? This isn't a good look on God's people. They're saying, where is my God? That's what the haters are saying. The psalmist is showing us that we can lament to God with honor and honesty. And the best relationships in life are marked by this combination of honor and honesty. Just think about marriage. You know, honor and honesty. It's like my wife and I are having a discussion. We need to work through something. I'm gonna honor her. Uh, Honey, I love you. That's not gonna change, but there's something I need to talk about with you. Gotta be honest. You need to stay on your side of the bed in the middle of the night because you're an absolute furnace. It's impossible to sleep next to you, right? Am I the only one? Okay, no, that's beside the point. Like, I gotta honor my wife as we work through challenges, and then I honestly have to communicate to her the things that are going on. And that's a silly example, but it gets much more real when it's like, hey, honey, I love you. Uh, I care so much about you. Where are you? Where have you been? Or, hey, you're my friend. I love you. I care about you. You're in our life group. We're, we, we are, we're on the same team. Where have you been? You haven't been present. You've been working too much. You've been golfing too much. You've been on your phone too much. The healthiest relationships have that honor and have that honesty. And I think God is inviting us to have that healthy relationship with him as we approach him with honor and fear and honesty as as we're going through things that we're lamenting. And so I want to just invite you to lament as you go through things that are challenging, whether it be uh, you pouring out your soul in infertility, it's honor and honesty. When you lose your job, it's honor and honesty. When your family's falling apart because of divorce, it's honor and honesty. When you lose a parent or a loved one, it's crying out to God with honor and honesty. We're meant to lament to God with honor and honesty. Honesty, because he already knows it. He already knows your thoughts. He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows how you feel. He already knows the fullness of your frustration. And then honor, because as we learned in our last series on awe, because he is God. He is in control. He is all powerful. We ought to fear him. He is good. And he is sovereign. Even when we don't feel like it. God is inviting us in this psalm to lament in this way. And the Bible has a real life example of this. And the sons of Korah would have known about this. You see, in those generations that I mentioned previously, there was a woman named Hannah who cried out to God. And the scriptures say in 1 Samuel 1, she poured out her soul to God. And she was pouring out her soul to God because of the infertility that she was experiencing with honesty and with honor. She poured out her soul. 
and the sons of Korah are in this lineage. These worship leaders would come later from that same family. These writers know. They know the pain. So we can lament with honor and honesty. And let's look to our last response in spiritual drought in verse 11. It's also in verse five. It's repeated. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. My salvation and my God. The third thing we must know as we respond to spiritual drought is to lift yourself up with hope. Lift yourself up with hope. That's what the psalmist is doing. Halfway through the psalm, the psalmist reminds himself of what's true. Hope's in God. My hope is in God. I will again praise God. He's my salvation. He's my God. He's just reminding himself of truth. He's singing truth, not just once, but twice. It's almost like we're a forgetful people. And we need to continuously remind ourselves of what is true. We must continually lift ourselves up with hope. And I have a friend who's amazing at this. And in fact, it's, it's funny that he's amazing at this because he has a terrible voice. But his name is Charlie Ramsey. And he works for Baylor. And probably a few of you may know of him. But Charlie and I were in Southeast Asia a few years ago, helping with some church plants there. And, and I, I shared a room with him. And whenever we would wake up, he was just singing. He just woke up singing songs and, and hymns and spiritual songs. It's like almost like he believed the Bible uh, and, and, and obeyed it. So he would just wake up singing songs and just was filled with joy. He's one of the most amazing people in the world. And I really, really believe he is so good at just lifting himself up with hope. He is somebody that I'm reminded of when I think about this. Because this is a song. That's why we sing on Sundays even when we don't feel like it. To remind ourselves of what is true. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. That's terrible, I know. But that's what we're here for. To sing even when we don't feel like it. And then as we go about our days, sing through our days in worship and even just remind ourselves of truth. Even if you just say the simple thing, I hope in God for I shall again praise him. He's my salvation and he's my God. Even if you just remind yourself of that truth alone daily, it will help you lift up your soul to find hope again. And what's crazy is the world gets self-talk right. I don't know if y'all have seen social media recently, daily affirmations are at an all-time high. Like it's a researched thing that the government would tell you to do, psychologists would tell you to do. It is a way to lift up your soul. And so people are all over the internet saying, I am successful and I am strong. And I'm like, that's subjective, right? Like, do I look strong? Like, what a, what a funny thing. And, and it's, it's not funny because it actually is working for so many people. But the reality is that's all about self. And this is all about God. We lift up our, our souls with hope by reminding ourselves of who God is. We point to the thing that's objective, unchanging, God. My hope is in God, not in my strength, but in God. That's what we do daily as we remind ourselves of truth and we sing these things to ourselves. Why? Because there are hard times. There are seasons that feel like spiritual drought. And we have to remind ourselves in those seasons of what is true. And so we lift ourselves with hope. Not just once, but over and over again, day after day, because sometimes those seasons of drought last a long time. In Waco, it's been almost a year. So I don't know what your drought may be or what your challenge may be that you're working through, but it may take time. But I know if it's not good, then God's not done. And if it's not fixed, then God's not finished. If it won't be on earth, it will all be restored in eternity. You can rest assured in that. And, and lastly, we have this ultimate hope. It's not just a lastly thing, really. It's the ultimate hope that we get in Jesus. 
who gives us these things of, of newness of life, the promises that all things will be made new, that by his wounds we will be healed. Those things are true because of the cross of Jesus. That's where our hope is found. So we must remind ourselves of this truth and of this hope. We should be the most hope-filled people in the world as we respond to spiritual drought. Would we, in summary, long for God and know that it's normal? Would we lament to God with honor and honesty? And would we preach to ourselves hope as we go about our days? In the late 1800s, there was a wealthy Chicago businessman named Horatio and Horatio and his family were going through a challenging time where they had lost a family member. And to be encouraged, they just prepared themselves uh, to go to England to visit a man named D.L. Moody. And so as their family got ready to go visit D.L. Moody, uh, Horatio, they were getting ready and Horatio had some business come up. So he sent his family along to England before he could join. And what ends up happening is his four daughters and his wife get onto a boat headed to England to visit D.L. Moody. And on the way, the boat sank. And in the wreckage, rescuers found his wife unconscious on a plank of wood. She was rescued, sent to England, and she wrote to Horatio, saved alone. What shall I do? So Horatio receives this, this note, devastated. He, he, he makes his way towards England. He gets on the next boat to England to go and be with his wife in this time of mourning and, and lament. And as they're crossing over the ocean, the captain pulls him aside in kindness and says, this is where the boat went down. This is where your daughters went down. And it is in that spot that he went down into the boat to write and pin himself a reminder, a lament that's filled with honor and honesty, but that was meant to lift himself up in hope and is there in the boat at the water graves of his family that he pinned these words. When peace like a